Okay, so it says indigenous music of North America, indigenous peoples of North America. And it says cultural origins, United States, Canada, Mexico. And then it says here indigenous peoples of North America, including Native Americans in the United States and Aboriginal peoples in Canada, indigenous peoples in Mexico and other. The Pablo music and Inuit music is considered as tribal traditional tribal music and it says American groups there now exist pan tribal or intertribal genres as well as distinct Native American subgenres of popular music including rock, blues, hip hop, classical, uh film music and reggae as well as unique popular styles like chicken scratch and New Mexico music. Now, we know that reggae, classical, hip-hop, blues, rock, that they would consider those as, like, black art forms or African-American music. But we know that these genres of music, as they said, they're indigenous to the Americas, you know. So how could they be um, considered as African? So we're going to get into that. We're going to get into jazz music. We're going to get into blues music, and we're also going to take a look at rock and roll and hip-hop. Okay, so this lady right here, she's of the Tuscarora Nation, and it says Tuscarora Nation Blues, Pure of Fee. And it says, with her voice soaring, foot stomping, this beautiful songbird transcends time and brings the message of our ancestors who have sown this beautiful seed that makes powerful music, Taj Mahal. Pura Fee is a singer, songwriter, musician, dancer, actor, actress, activist, and teacher. She is the founding mother of the international renowned native a cappella trio, Yula Lee, which has toured the world for 19 years. Pura Fee was born in New York City in August 18th, 1959. Her Spanish names translate as pure faith, given by her father, who is from Puerto Rico. She was raised by her Tuscarora mother and gifted family of female singers that migrated from North Carolina to New York in the early 1900s. Pura Fees explains the indigenous Native American, what we know to be American Indian, Influence on the birth of blues. Her soulful voice and acoustic lap steel slide guitar carries the ancestral message of the indigenous world and missing history, which tells the story of the relationship between the black and Indian people of the South. It says this union gave birth to a rich new culture blending religion, dance, and food, good looking people, and the blues. Many of these grandchildren became influential musicians. Charlie uh, Patton, the first king of blues, is Choctaw. Scrapper Blackwell is Cherokee. You know, Jimi Hendrix, I believe. He's Cherokee, I think. Um, Don Cherry, Duke Ellington, Thelonious Monk, Little Richard, Tina Turner. And so we know that Duke Ellington is a jazz musician. Um, Little Richard, Tina Turner, and also Jimi Hendrix were known for making rock and roll music. And it says, there are so many blues and jazz pioneers that have expressed their native ancestry through their work. In this album, Pure Fee relates a deeply personal history with her beautiful spirit and voice. This beautiful album is complete with songs of love, history, and anthems for her Tuscarora Indian Nation of North Carolina. She introduces the Dear Clan singers who bring us their traditional southern style of ancient Tuscarora to tell songs, the legendary Willie Lowry plays wonderful guitar. Cool John Ferguson adds his magical touch on guitar as well. And here is from the website culturalsurvival.org. Since I sing what's inside me, Jennifer Elizabeth Chrisberg is a singer, composer, and, and activist. Jennifer Elizabeth. Chris Berg of the Tuscarora of North Carolina 
comes from four generations of singing sisters on her maternal line. Her fierce and passionate vocals have appeared on soundtracks for movies such as Smoke Signals, Unnatural, and Accidental, The Business of Fancy Dancing, Elijah, Follow Me Home, and on the television series The Native Americans in a newly released documentary, Rumble, The Indians Who Rock, Rocketed the World. At age 17, Chris Berg became the youngest member of Eulali, the, the critically acclaimed female a cappella trio who have brought native music to venues such as Woodstock in 1994. Okay, so I'm going to skip down. I sing what's inside me. If something bugs me, I sing about it. Everything inspires me. It's what I feel inside and what I see. She cites Mariah Carey, Aretha Franklin, Shaka Khan as her contemporary vocal influences and names her family as the biggest source of influence and per, uh, pursuing music, singing singing in various native languages, including her traditional Tuscarora language. Okay, so I'm going to leave that there and I'm going to let you get a good look at her. And as you see, she's copper colored and she has long, wavy type hair and her hair is thick. Okay, so now I'm going to show you uh, video footage that's on Tasha She's uh, YouTube channel that shows her and her sister singing. Is that back when the first contact happened, we had a very specific style of singing. before plantations and slavery and so forth and colonization. People are really shocked when they hear the traditional music of the South, East. They're like, that's Indian music? I thought that was African music. Okay, the Smithsonian at si.edu. It says Duke Ellington, born in Washington, D.C., as Edward... Kennedy, and nicknamed Duke Ellington, rose to fame at Harlem's Cotton Club in the late 1920s. His career as a musician, composer, and band leader spanned more than 50 years. Among his many compositions are hundreds of short pieces and more ambitious extended works, including operas, ballets, musicals, concert pieces, such as Black, Brown, and Beige, and the Sacred Concerts. He was decorated with numerous awards and honors, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, presented by President Nixon in 1969, Smithsonian Jazz, as the Smithsonian National Museum of American History explores the American experience through the transformative power of jazz. See, you see how powerful it is that even the National Museum has to honor um this American art form and this particular American Indian because he was such a great, you know, musician and composer. So this is a bust of Duke Ellington. Okay. This is a uh, a portrait gallery of him. There's another portrait of him. This is a portrait of him. This is another picture of him. This is a picture of him as an older gentleman. Okay, this one right here is a picture of him as a young man. There's a picture right here of him. Okay, and then, and as we know, look at this, look at this. National Museum of African American History and Culture. It's not African American as we know, it's American Indian. But we're going to get into that later. It's a picture of him right here. Okay. All right. And then I want to read to you another article that pertains uh, to jazz and what they have to say about jazz. And then we'll 
see the reason why they've been trying to push it as an African art form, even though it's an American Indian one. Okay, so this is by a website that is called PRX, Native Roots of Jazz. It's a series produced by KBEM. Okay. Now, it says here, Native flute player Bob Fantauzo illuminates the contributions made by jazz musicians with Native American heritage. It says it is commonly held that jazz developed out of the synthesis of European and African music, which we know that is not true, you know, because uh, African music, I just don't see it as being the case because that's an indigenous music. And, uh, and as you see that on Wikipedia, they listed it as an indigenous music. So, you know, they just don't want to give credit, obviously, to the American Indians and that the American Indians had created this art form. Now, European, now, as far as they're saying, like, classical, then maybe, you know, then you can see, like, elements of classical music there. It says, however, it says, few people are aware of jazz was also influenced by Native American music, although the influence of Native American music on jazz has not been widely expressed, it has not gone unnoticed. Oscar Pettiford extended that the importance of American Indian to jazz has been underestimated and not completely overlooked. He also maintained that the 4-4 tempo came directly from the American Indian, that though it existed in European music, it was not used in the same way, and that African rhythms were of a very different rhythmic nature. So he letting you know right here, you know, that they try to lay claim and say that it's jazz is African and European. And they saying, yeah, you know, European music it has a 4-4 tempo, but it's not used the same way like the American Indians use it. And they're saying that the rhythm of the beat of jazz music is not the same as African people's music. So it is totally, from what I'm getting here, American Indian. It says, Native flute player Bob Fantozo narrates a series of short biographical pieces highlighting some of the giants of jazz with native roots. Okay, so here he has P.B. Russell asserted that he's part Cherokee. You have Max Roach, who is known as a bebop player, and he was of Tuscarosa ancestry. You have Oscar Pettiford, and he said that his mother was full-blooded Choctaw, his father was half Cherokee, and then you have the son of a Creek mother and a call father, saxophonist Jim Pepper. Then you have here Charlie Parker. It says the leading figure in the development of bebop, Charlie Parker of Choctaw ancestry. Then you have here of Tuscarora ancestry, Thelonious Monk. Okay. It says the uh, one of the most inventive pianists of any musical genre. Then you have Charles Lloyd. Okay. And they don't directly say it right there for me to see. Then you got John Lewis. John Lewis was of Cherokee and Comanche lineage. And you have Illinois Jaquette. Jean Patiste Paquette is better known by his name, Illinois, which was given to him by his Sioux mother and comes from the Indian word. And then it says Native Roots of Dizzy Gillespie. He was of the She Ra descent. See, you don't really hear about that too much. Then they mention Duke Ellington whose maternal grandmother was Cherokee. And then you have Miles Davis, who's of Cherokee ancestry as well. Then you also have Don Cherry, Choctaw ancestry, was one of the most lyrical and unique voices in jazz. Then you have Ornette Coleman, whose family ties reach back to the Ona Chi tribe in North Carolina. Then you have 
uh, Dave Burbeck, whose father was of Medoc descent. Okay. So, and then you have these ladies here, uh, Mildred Bailey as the first full-time female big band singer in America. She helped popularize jazz singing and opened the door for later jazz greats. Okay. You have Sheila Jordan, who often credited her native roots. Then you have here Charles Mingus. He was a bassist, composer, and big band leader. Charles Mingus claimed Native American history uh, roots. So um, you have quite a few people. To me, it looks as though overwhelmingly that you have a lot of people, if not the majority people, who created this art form are indeed American Indians for the most part. Some of them may have, you know, African ancestry or European ancestry, but they all said the same thing and they all let people know about their American Indian roots, their American Indian heritage. So this is an American Indian art form, even though they tried their best to try to cover up that fact. Now we're looking at Cab Calloway, and this is by Florida Chronicle. And it says, in that period, America discovered its own cultural voices, Brooks said. He said, swing encompasses Hispanic, European, African-American, and Native American culture. And it says here, he noted that Calloway's ethnicity was primarily African-American and Iroquois. Now we know that African-Americans... We know that those are Indians, too, because we know that the Indians were reclassified as African-American and colored and Negro, of course. And you have here, Brooks said the Native American influence and in swing can be heard in the way of Callaway's drummers, such as Kazi Cole approached the four on the floor, Kansas City swing rhythm using accents on the beats rather than playing the, the rhythm straight. That approach closely resembles Native American rhythms, Brooks explains. 
Okay. And this is the intro of Cap Calloway's Heidi Ho. And it was published in 1934. And you know that, you know, that he was pretty young then at that time. So I like the way it sounds at the beginning because it reminds me of Little John's crunk music. And I think Little John probably, probably was influenced by him. Just listen to this. And right here you have Old Dirty Bastard, who's of the Shinnecock tribe. And he told them on Howard Stern that he's an Indian. And they couldn't believe it because the Paleo Indians got reclassified as black and African American. So here he is talking about that. And as you know, he was a part of the hip-hop group Wu-Tang Clan. And a lot of the members of the Wu-Tang Clan are from the Shinnecock tribe. Nice whip. What the hell are you doing? Who are you supposed to be dressed like, Jay? Little Wayne. It's what he wore to. 
his last runway show. Oh, Lil Wayne. He told me I needed to try to fit in, so I stayed up all last night studying your culture. Sorry, what? And to those who say jazz is the only indigenous American art form, I say listen to a little Jay-Z, my friend. Oh. <laughs> and this artist is a reggae artist by the name of Eric Donaldson, and his song is called Cherry O Baby. singer and songwriter, an influential figure in popular music and culture. For more than six decades, Little Richard's most celebrated work dates from the mid-1950s, when his dynamic music and charismatic showmanship laid the foundation for rock and roll. His music also played a key role in the formation of other popular music genres, including soul and funk. Little Richard influenced numerous singers and musicians across musical genres from rock to hip-hop. His music helped shape rhythm and blues for generations to come, and his performances and headline-making thrust his career right into the mix of... That's pretty good. And the Georgia Peach, too. Oh, yeah, the Georgia Peach, too. How do you find time to do both? Uh, well, you know, uh, I'm from Macon, Georgia. I'm from there. James Brown is from there. Otis Redden is from there, and Wayne Cochran is from there. I was the best looking one to leave, so I left first. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you silly. <laughs> uh, we, uh, <laughs> I, I think we... something before you go from me. It's something I've always wanted to do all my life. Uh-oh. And uh, uh, all, all of my life, I've always wanted to do this. I've always just wanted to host a show. Host a I've show? I've been in the business so long, and I'm the only Indian in the business today. How do you mean the only Indian? I'm the only Indian. The other one that you had out here, he's not in the business. He's a stuntman. 